on the reverse side of this tape on the 7th of August the following day. I would like to skip over some of the material that I prepared for uh, November 9th to an additional body, a separate body of material, which is simply a commentary on the text of Genesis 10. As I read through some of this commentary material, and I was unable to carry it very far, I only went from verse 1 to 8, so it's only a commentary on Genesis uh, 10, 1 through 8 at the present time. But that'll probably be sufficient to give a pretty strong impression. Uh, and the advantage of going to a commentary format is the straightforwardness of it, the traditional character of it, and the simplicity of it. But because I am skipping forward to a commentary, there are some unstated assumptions that may creep in that were in the other material that I haven't read into the tape. With that reservation, let me begin with Genesis 10, verse 1, where you have the antediluvians Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth in that order, listed in that order. And, of course, we have a narrative text that has supplied us with those names up to this point. So we know that Noah is the father and Shem, Ham, and Japheth are the sons. Because these names introduce the table of nations, they're independent of the table to the extent that the persons to whom they refer reappear under different names within it. Now that needs some commentary right away. Genesis 10 is one of these symmetrical structures, comparable, roughly comparable to something like Revelation chapter 2 or 2 Peter 1, 5 through 7 or the four Gospels, or whatever. There's a certain degree of symmetrical design in the Genesis 10 structure that distinguishes it to some extent from simply the flow of the text up to that point. Now, it's a symmetrical design, and yet the symmetry's been broken down. And my explanation of the breakdown is a series, again, of chaotic events. The Sin of Ham, Genesis 9, the Tower of Babel event, Genesis 11, and the Erech Arata War, which is probably the most important single event of early post-Diluvian history that uh, God chose not to reveal in Scripture. It's a, it's a secular event, but it's a place where uh, the history of Noah's family and, and, and uh, the, the sacred history and secular history uh, mesh, which they often do if you're studying Scriptures in historical context. So the Erech Arata War is a historical contextual uh, element uh, lurking behind what you see in Genesis 9 through 11, and then Genesis 14, the scene of the Abrahamic War with Melchizedek and, and Barak, king of Sodom. Because of these events, the system, uh, the symmetry that is in Genesis 10 is a, is a vitiated symmetry. It's broken down. I believe that if the symmetry had held, you would have seen the same thing that you see in the opening verses after verse 1. That is, you see seven sons of Japheth, the septad structure, and then the sons of Gomer, three, a triad, and then the sons of Javan, four, and three and four make seven. There are other passages of Scripture where you talk about deriving a seven from a summation of three and four, and that's what you see there in the opening verses, that is two, three, and four of, uh, of Genesis 10. None of the other structures of Genesis 10 have that feature. There is a set of seven, however, in a very important structure in Genesis 10, Genesis 10, seven, where I believe the Cushites are seven in number. And then Nimrod in the next verse makes an eighth, but it, he's handled separately. So it's a broken structure, but it's a structure that is, again, there's enough symmetry there to indicate that there was an originally a symmetrical design, but that it broke down because of political forces. And my explanation of Genesis 10 is that it's chiefly political and secondarily genetic. It has a very real genetic element in it, but its primary <coughs> designing principle is theocratic politics. Now the general view, again, among the Baconians, the skeptics, the post-biblicists, the higher critics, whatever, they also notice that the text of Genesis 10 looks different from the surrounding context. And they conclude that this is Moses or whoever's effort at amateur ethnography, a kind of summation of peoples known to the Jews at an early point in their history surrounding them making stabs in the dark, trying to associate a name Tubal because they knew about some people called Tubal up in Asia Minor or something, and sort of tacking that onto the name Japheth as an effort at piecemeal uh, symmetry building again by the author. And again, for the reasons stated on side A, I completely reject that kind of skeptical position. No, the, the table of nations is grounded in the family of Noah after the flood. That's what the text says, and that's what it means. However... 
there is a middle position between these two extremes, between the idea that Genesis 10 is mere genetics, mere genealogy. It's not presented like a genealogy. You don't have a genealogy, you don't have a, a father, son, grandson, and so forth. What you have instead is a, it's kind of like a clan list, groups of sons. And my conclusion is that in many cases, the term son does not refer to an immediate uh, physical offspring. Sometimes they are immediate physical offspring. I don't know whether I stated this on the other side of the tape, but in the case of the first three Japhethites, Gomer, Magog, and Madai, my researches have led to the conclusion that those are begotten sons of Japheth. The same uh, processes have led me to conclude that the four sons of Ham and ten six are his immediate begotten sons. And that happens. But that's not the general rule. As an instance, the fourth Japhethite Javan, in my opinion, is a grandson of Japheth through Gomer. The sixth Meshach is another grandson of Japheth through Madai, his third son. And the other two, uh, Tiras and Tubal, are exported for political reasons from the family of Shem. But first of all, we're talking about the family of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. They are distinguishable, but they were not separated. They are distinguishable, though they were never separated. None of these lines was a holy line except after the fact because uh, Shem was a man of higher moral character than Ham. That's very clear to me. And that had uh, political theocratic implications for the future and for the uh, future history of Israel. Uh, Shem was a kind of type of Christ. Ham wasn't. Ham, uh, uh, in many ways, give, uh, gives every evidence of having been a reprobate and Shem of having been a righteous man like his father Noah. But this did not mean that the, gen the genes of Shem were wholly a priori, far from it, that his distinguishing genetic mark was that he was the son of the white matriarch who was out of the Canaanite stock, and the distinguishing mark of Ham that he was the son of the red mar matriarch out of the Abelite stock, and we can see that Abel was the godly man. So th there is a genetic factor, but it cannot be oversimplified along separatistic lines. Suffice it to say that the Table of the Nations is a structure that is primarily political, but has a strong genetic component in it. It's only ethnographic after the fact. We are dealing with men. I think it was someone, uh, St. Augustine or someone said uh, uh, something to the effect that these are nations, not men. Well, they are men who founded nations. But their genetic relationships are subordinated to certain political relationships and politics and theocratic politics are in control of the design of the text. Now, because the text is different, distinguishable in principle from just the flow of the genealogical record of who Noah, Ham, Shem, and Japheth were and what happened to them in the flood and what happened to them after the flood, and then again the account of Genesis 11, there's enough difference between the Folkertoffel, the Table of the Nations, in its design that there's a higher level of symmetry and there's a distinct a distinction that results in a very peculiar circumstance. I discovered this about, oh, I guess 10 years ago. I wasn't aware of it at first in my studies, but as the, my studies went on, I became aware of one very odd circumstance. And that is that whenever you have a person in the genealogical narrative text, someone like Noah, Shem, Ham, Japheth, Peleg, the other figures in the genealogy of Genesis 11, or the genealogical structures, they reappear in the Folkertoffel under a different name, under different names. Peleg reappears in the section under Shem's name under the name Lud, son of Shem, meaning really vassal because he was his great-great-grandson or something. Peleg reappears as Lud, the patriarch of the Lydians, the Ludu. Uh, Joktan reappears under the name Aram, Aram the High One, a very important figure, as was Peleg, two sons of Eber. And then, not only is there a reappearance in the Semite section on the part of these imperial line Shemite figures, but sometimes some of the Shemite figures appear over in the, over in the Japhethite list. Tubal, I believe, is the Japhethite name of the imperial messianic line figure Eber, the father of Peleg and Joktan. So that Peleg and Joktan are renamed in the Folkertoffel in the, in, in the uh, Shemite section and... Uh, Eber is renamed in the Japhethite section for specific political reasons related to the Arakarata War specifically. The, the, the fact that Sheila, the, one of the imperial line figures, is Lugal Banda and lay, later the mythological Marduk and he's the captain of the general of the forces of Arak that attack Arata 
and the, and the other seven men, captains that follow him, are the Japhethite list of ten two, and to form up this alliance against the Rada from the Arakite Mesopotamian standpoint, uh, Eber is recruited into the Jeph Japhethite clan or Japhethite group, whatever you want to call it, politically. And that type of political undercurrent is always shaping and molding what you have in the text of Genesis 10. Now, one of the strangest of all of these reappearances where you have the names Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, those are what I would call genealogical names or narrative names or whatever you want to call them. These four also reappear in the text of Genesis 10 under different names and under very unusual circumstances, even more so. They all appear in Genesis 10, 7 as vassals of the black son of Ham, Cush. Now, I'm not going to go into an immediate explanation of why that is, but that's where they appear. And by making them vassals of their own offspring, you can say very quickly that this is the result of the upheaval of the sin of Ham and of the political revolution that converted Noah, patriarch of all the Gentiles, into Utanapishtim or Zia Sudra, the faraway, a person who survived the flood and has no authority and power to found or establish anything. In other words, the Hamite rebels succeeded in dethroning Noah. And one aspect of that dethroning process, and in fact the dethroning of all four of the antediluvian males, is that they are re-enlisted and re-enrolled in the Genesis 10 system as vassals of Cush. And that's part of the record of Gentile chaos as interpreted. You know, you can just see the names. Now you say, well, how do you arrive at that conclusion? Well, after studying all the names of Genesis 10, I found very strong cases for each of the patriarchs, but I kept finding that there was no separate human being for Lud apart from Peleg, no separate human being for Aram apart from Joktan, and no separate Shem, Ham, Japheth, and Noah apart from the Cushite names, or let's turn it around the other way. I found no evidence for the, four, for the existence of the four figures named in the Cushite uh, clan of Genesis 10-7 apart from Noah, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. And I simply put it together and discovered that that's where the four antediluvians were relegated. That's where they were located once the Fokertoffel was built. And the Fokertoffel was built as a political reality. It's not in the mind of Moses. It's in the mind of the post-diluvian community in building a theocracy. And it was a theocracy patched together because of the chaos resulting from a cold war created by the sin of Ham and the curse of Noah on Ham's heir Canaan. Well, to take up the text of the commentary then. Because these names, Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, introduce the table of the nations, they are independent of the table to the extent that the persons to whom they refer, the four antediluvian males who survived the flood, reappear under different names within it. Politically, the four antediluvians are enrolled as vassals, feudal sons of Cush, son of Ham, in Genesis 10:7. Noah as Dedan, Amorite Didanu, another system outside the scripture is the king list of the Amorites, the Amuru. And they also enroll Noah, and they enroll him under the name Didanu, which is clearly a cognate to the, to the Hebrew uh, Dedan. The Amorites, the Amuru, uh, were speakers of a Semitic tongue. And there are some cognates, at least that cognate, that turns up in this case. Noah appears as Dedan at the bottom of the Cushite list. Shem appears as Rahama, which may or may not be a cognate to the East Indian Brahma, the originator. The reason why Shem is known to the Satamarians, to the East Indians, as Brahm, the originator, is that he uh, was the originator of the Indo-European stock, which is the Canite stock, which is the stock that came through his mother, the white matriarch. And then he acquired the Semitic stock, which was authored by Ham, on the basis of the race of Havala, through the curse, the dual name, Yahweh Elohim, Yahweh Indo-European, Elohim Semite. And so uh, that dual stock was acquired by Shem. But as part of the retaliation of the family of Ham, they have succeeded in enrolling Shem the man under the political identity of Rahama the vassal of Cush. Ham appears as Havala. And that's a name that's duplicate. That's a name that duplicates the geographic name of Genesis 2. And that simply is, an, is a, an intimation, an inkling of this relationship between Ham, his mother, the red matriarch, and the line of Abel and the land of Havilah, one of the four races of Adam's family. 
Ham is named in 10.7 as Havilah, male carrier of the Abelite race of Havilah in Genesis 2.11. And Japheth appears as Sheba, Amorite Suabu or Sumuabu, Shem is my father, indicating Shem's vassalage to Rahama, that Sheba's vass vassalage to Rahama, Japheth's vassalage to his brother Shem, which some might guess from the cursed blessing passage where uh, Japheth will dwell in the tents of Shem. Well, it happens right here politically because the text of Genesis 10:7 says that Sheba is a secondary vassal of the vassal Rahama, that Sheba is, and that's Japheth vassal to his own brother uh, Shem, but both of them somehow, in some way, uh, through an upheaval, vassals of the first son of Cush. The overall vassalage to Cush is a detail of the great political upheaval of the sin of Ham, but it appears to have been based on the concept that the antediluvian land of Cush in 2.13 housed the proper race of Adam, fountainhead of antediluvian mankind. You see that? See, that's the connection. All of this work against the authority of Noah and his three sons was based on the specious argument that they were cursed antediluvians and that in effect they died in the flood. They didn't die in the flood, but that they belonged to the generation who did. They belonged to that world that re represented the old order. And Cush was a name taken from the old order. It was extracted from the old order because it's a, it's a geographic name as well as Havala back in Genesis 2. As reinforcement of this view, the Amorite king list refers to Seba at the head of the Cushite list as Adamu, Sumerian Adapa, the first sinner, and the mythological version of Adam, in effect. In other words, the name and identity of Adam is attributed to the figure who's at the head of the Cushite clan. So you see the whole, how the whole thing is working symbolically? The argument against the authority of Noah and his sons by the younger generations that were part of this Hamite conspiracy, centering in Canaan, Ham's son, and his son, Sidon, and his son, Shelah, who appears over in the, in the Messianic line of Shem, that conspiracy argued against the authority of Noah and his three sons, especially Noah, on the basis that they belonged to the cursed Adamic antediluvian world. And to confirm that, they were located in a clan uh, under the control of a patriarch named for an antediluvian zone. And not only that, but the antediluvian zone inhabited by the Negro race of Adam, the original Cushites, and uh, under a patriarch, that, that is under Cush, the first name is Seba, and Seba is the great Shiv Osiris figure, son of Japheth and the black matriarch. And this, this figure is called by the uh, Amorite king list Adamu, Adam, and he's identified in the Sumerian mythology with Adapa, who is a kind of primary sinner, which is what we know Adam to be, of course, Adam and Eve. And so the whole idea is that the family of Noah was cursed because they belonged to the to the Adamic world uh, before the flood. A major factor in the Hamite scheme to overthrow Noah's authority was to implicate him and his three antediluvian sons, including Ham, in the general curse that doomed antediluvian mankind. Of course, that was a lie, because if these men hadn't survived, there wouldn't be any post-diluvian world. So why separate the post-diluvians from the antediluvians who survived? It doesn't make any sense at all, but it was a, it was a distortion of a semi-truth that the antediluvians were cursed, but uh, Noah and his four and three sons found grace with God and were blessed instead. They were saved. And so in a sense, this argument given by the rebels was an anti-salvation argument. It was like saying, well, they were cursed. Let them be cursed. Because it was an effort to retaliate against Noah for having cursed the post-diluvian heir of Ham, namely Canaan, because he does curse Canaan. I mean, it's right there in the text of Scripture, Genesis 9. Genesis 10, 2, the vassals of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, and Tiras, taking them one at a time. Gomer, Japheth's physical son by the yellow matriarch. Gomer emerges in the West Semitic list of Ibla as Gumalum, cognate with Gomer, and in the Egyptian dynasty 4 as Khufu, Cheops, certainly not a cognate with Gomer, builder of the Great Pyramid. An Egyptian portrait statue of Khufu shows his mongoloid features as tempered by his paternal grandmother, the white matriarch, of course, Japheth's mother. Japheth's original claim land immediately after the flood was the Syria of Ibla, and his original people transferred to Ham the Egyptians. See, that was that musical chairs revolution created by the sin of, sin of Ham. The so-called Semitic people were stripped from Ham, and they were the people of Elohim, and they were given by Noah to Shem, and that created a whole revolutionary cycle 
in which the people who are originally created, according to the solar principle, as I called it, the people of, of, of Japheth were transferred to Ham, and eventually the people of Shem, the Indo-Europeans, were transferred to Japheth. And it was a, a total uh, uh, revolutionary uh, process that shed irregularity, broke down the symmetry, and therefore opened the door to the empiricists who doubt the existence of a god of symmetry, because they're reasoning from the chaos of their own personal experience and the personal experience of their ancestors, the Gentiles, who had this happen to them. Javis' immediate claim land after the flood was Syria of Ebla. Now, you say, well, what is Gomer, a son of Japheth, doing in the Semitic territory of Ebla? The point is that these are international feudal aristocrats. They transcend any one linguistic stock, although each one of them has a special relationship to various linguistic stocks. It's, they're not segregated. They, they reign and rule side by side. And when the time comes to reign at a Semitic loca location, they do so as Semitic speakers. And so the whole clan, the whole set of Japhethites turns Semitic at Ebla. And the same thing is true when they turn up in another chronological context as Dynasty IV of Egypt, where they all become Egyptians. Now, Japheth had a right to, uh, to function as a, and his sons had a right to function as Egyptians because he, he fathered the whole, the whole race. But again, you've got to get the idea, these are not a people. This is not a nation. The family of Noah were not a race. They were international feudal, quasi-angelic aristocrats with multiple careers, multiple names, and multiple identities. That's the nature of an international feudal aristocrat. That's the character of that kind of person, of whom we can find many in the record of feudal history in Europe. Magog, the, other, the next son, son of Japheth in 10.2. The Celtic Gaels are correct in tracing their descent from Magog, Japheth's natural son, by the red matriarch, again, this systematic polygamy, concubinage side by side with a monogamy, just as you find it in the case of Abraham. And Magog was a son of Japheth by the red matriarch, hence the marked facial concavity and small overall size of many Scots because they're Gaels, or at least there are Gaels among the Scots. When the Egyptian protoplast was transferred from Japheth to Ham, some of these became into Europeans and therefore Celts the, the Celts, the Egyptian cognates of certain Kentum Indo-European Europe, excuse me, the, the Celtic people are Indo-Europeans with an Egyptian background, an Egyptian twist. They were people who at the time of this great upheaval and transference where Japheth had controlled his own people, the Egyptians, and he lost them, and he took and instead he inherited the Indo-Europeans of his brother Shem. Certain, certain people who had been earmarked for Egypt and for location in the Hamitic linguistic stock were carried over into the Indo-European stock and they became distinguished among the Indo-Europeans as Celts. So in a sense, Celts are Egyptian Indo-Europeans. That's the point. Madai, the third son. Well, excuse me, let me, let me repeat that sentence. When the Egyptian protoplast was transferred from Japheth to Ham, some of these became Indo-Europeans, and therefore Celts, the Egyptian cognates of Kentum Indo-European Europe. Magog was to the Gaels what Gomer was to the Welsh, and that, of course, is, again, there's a, there's a strong correlation between the entire Celtic race and the, and the family of Japheth in, in 10.2, which is what we're looking at. The third son, however, as far as I know, has nothing to do with the Celts. It's Madai. And there you have another dimension of Japhethite early post-Diluvian history reflected in the Iranian polarity of the Medes, the traditional descendants of Madai. For the seven Japhethites to victory over Iranian errata, all seven of the Japhethites established claim lands in Iran. They're all feudal aristocrats, so they have holdings in all many, many areas on the Earth's surface, you see. And the Japhethites had a special claim to Iran because of a victory that they won over Ar Iranian errata at a time when the world's population was divided into two parts, one in Mesopotamia and the other in Iran. The people of Gomer, Welsh Lear, became the Lurs of Luristan. Eventually, the Lurs actually are descendants of the Cimmerians who bear the name Gomer. But uh, that wasn't the way I originally identified the Lurs with uh, uh, Gomer. It was because Lur answers to King Lear, that's Lur of the Welsh tradition, and that appeared to be Gomer for a variety of other reasons. So the fact that the Lurs are identifiable historically with the Cimmerians simply confirmed the whole thing over again. But I, I was established even before I realized that, even before I knew that the Lurs 
of Luristan were the Cimmerian people. I knew that they were the people of Gomer because the name Lur is another version of Gomer. See, it's another name for the same patriarch. The people of Gomer, Welsh Lear, became the Lures of Luristan. Those of Magog, Amerindian Huracano, became the Hyrcanians over on the, on the border of the, of the Caspian Sea. And the people of Madai, the familiar Medes of Gudium Media. Madai's originally Sumerian, original Sumerian name, Mashta, indicates his equation to Urhura Mazda, the high god of fire worshipping Zoroastrianism. So you're looking really into the heart of the Iranian religious heritage when you're considering Madai. Urhura Mazda. Sumerian Mashta, Hebrew Madai. In a Teutonic tradition, Madai appears as the fire god Logi, brother to Hlaer Gimmer, equivalent brother of, of Madai's, uh, equivalent version of Madai's brother Gomer. So you see these things fit together again if one has any eye for symmetry. And every, all the skeptics say, don't you know that symmetry can deceive you? And my reply is, don't you know that a, a commitment against symmetry can deceive you? You say, to me, don't you know that symmetry can deceive you? You can be misled into establishing a connection on the basis of a resemblance, a pattern, a design, and that can deceive you? Yes, it can deceive me. Do you know that your commitment against symmetry and against pattern and against design can deceive you? But of course, we're deceived in two different ways, theoretically, aren't we? I'm deceived by affirming something that is not true. You're deceived by denying something that is true. Now, what sends people to hell? Now, if when they get there, one group who are in hell are those who make and love a lie. So lying, affirming things that aren't true, is characteristic of people who are headed for hell. But what gets people to hell? Denying what is true, denial of the gospel. So we know, if we're going to trade off sins, we, we know that this is very definitely true on either side. I can be deceived by symmetry. You can be deceived by the absence of it. You see... We live in a risky universe. We live in a universe where your conscience has to operate and where your intellect has to operate. And we have to know how to balance the claims of symmetry. I don't jump to every conclusion. Every time I see a resemblance of name, I don't go running after that. The empirical skeptics have tried to say that about me back in the mid-60s. They tried to say, well, whenever Pilkey sees a symmetry, he just identifies anybody. He just, whenever he sees two names that resemble it, that's not true. That's not true. I'm able to negate. I'm able to say no. But I'm also able to say yes. And wait to the Bema. Wait to the Bema to see who's right on this. Let's wait and see who's right on this. I know where I stand. I know how to deny. But I also know how to affirm. Javan, the original Sumerian form. That's the fourth Javathite. The original Sumerian form of the name was Ibranum, a member of the king list of Gutium, the land of Madai. Accordingly, Javan is Bran, B-R-A-N, son of Lear, Lear Gomer, in the Welsh tradition. And Bran's son, Caradoc, accounts for the Carducci, or Kurds, of Kurdistan. The Carducci comes from the Assyrians, who recorded the presence of the Kurd people in ancient Assyrian times, adjacent to Luristan. Kurdistan was, and what are all these Japhethites doing there? I've just told you. They won the Erik Arata War over Arata that's in Iran, probably Isfahan. modern city of Isfahan is part of the location of Arata. Kurdistan was Javan's claim land in the spoils of the Erik Arata War, but geographically Kurdistan is difficult to distinguish from Media Gutium, so it's a little bit hard to distinguish where Javan's land or claim left off and where Madai's claim took up. Javan appears in the Egyptian Dynasty IV, remember the period, uh, di Pyramid Dynasty, that's still another dimension. So you've got the Iranian presence of the Japhethites, the Celtic presence of the Japhethites, the Iblaite presence of the Japhethites, and the, and the Egyptian presence, Dynasty IV of the Japhethites. And uh, as a skeptic once said to me back in the Dallas Seminary days, boy, these people get around, don't they? Yes, they got around, didn't they? Yes, they got around. They were international feudal aristocrats. The story of the flood is a universal, imperial, international reality. Yes, they got around. Yes, they got, yes, the sons of Israel did not. They inhabited one land and were one people, one nation, and twelve, 12 tribes. But these people are not Jews. They're not Jews. They're international, imperial aristocrats. And when I go to the Bema, I will be held accountable for testifying to you that internationalism, as well as nationalism, was and is. 
and there is a universe, and there is a cosmos, and there is an international community of nations, as well as individual nations, and that the nationalism of Israel is fine and marvelous and wonderful, but that that is not the be-all and the end-all of the cosmos of God's plan of history. To continue the brief entry on Javan, the third son of uh, Japheth in 10.2, uh, I keep moving from one Japhethite sphere to another, according to this central principle of internationalism. Kurdistan was Javan's claim land in the spoils of the Arakarata War, but geographically Kurdistan is difficult to distinguish from Media Gutium. Javan appears in the Egyptian dynasty four, there we go again, as Menkaura uh, to Herodotus Mycerinus, but the original Egyptian is uh, Menkaura the horizon of Ra, the subject of a brilliantly realistic portrait statue. In the Celtic world, there we go again, in the Celtic world, he gave his Sumerian Gutian name Ibranum to the Iverni the Irish. So, uh, abstractly speaking at least, if not concretely, if the Irish want to see their first ancestor, let them look at the Egyptian statue of, uh, of Menkaura. There he is. It's interesting that in Herodotus' account, he makes uh, Khufu and Kephren, the first two uh, pharaohs of the dynasty four, to have been terribly unpopular in Egypt, and he must have encountered something that suggests that they were tyrants. The claim was that they practiced a kind of interdict and shut down the temple so the people couldn't worship, but that when Menkaura Mycerinus came along, he was popular because he opened the temples again and allowed them to worship. Uh, there may be some tradition there that uh, somehow uh, Gomer was pulling in one direction spiritually, and his son Javan was... was uh, pulling in another direction spiritually. But anyway, that's the, the uh, anachronistic account of Herodotus. I mean, he's simply traditions that are floating down through the Egyptian people, presumably that Khufu and Kephren were very, very unpopular and that uh, Menkara was very popular. What they had in common was they were all pyramid builders. The fifth Japhethite, Tubal, I've already mentioned this exotic origin and identity that uh, virtually there's no genetic tie between Tubal and Japheth, but the tie is entirely political. And Tubal being Eber, Eber a son of Shelah, Shelah being the captain, the general that leads the entire body of Japhethite forces against Arata, so that his son becomes attached to the Japhethites as a member of the Japhethite septet of 10-2 under the name of Tubal. At this point, Japheth's physical progeny yields to a powerful patriarch of the imperial line of Shem. I call it imperial. That's another word I use. The, the, the biblical uh, theological abstract term is messianic because eventually this leads to the Messiah. But what the word mess, uh, messianic really means is uh, imperial, which is to say with a, with a power that extends beyond the nation alone. The Messiah of Israel is the Christ of the Christians. And although there's a national component, there's also an international component that transcends the, the nations. The Jews are God's earthly people. We Christians are his heavenly people, destined for the rapture, the bame, and the return. And all of that gives to us the aspect of this imperial, international, aristocratic image. And you say, well, where's our aristocracy? Well, it's the resurrection state. Because in the, return, in the rapture, we take on the resurrection state and that becomes a physical or metaphysical aristocracy. So when I'm talking about the aristocracy of the early post-Diluvians, I'm talking about, in principle, typologically speaking, the character of the church. And why is that? It's because in the Olivet Discourse, Christ says that, the, that his coming, the coming of the Son of Man, will be as in the days of Noah. Now that means that the latter stages of the present age of the church, the humiliated age of the church, we are living in an apostate frame of reference with all kinds of evils around us that is akin to the violence of the antediluvian world, the world before the flood. That means then that at Christ's rapture, Bema, return sequence, when we return, we will be doing the same kinds of things that were done not before but after the flood. As I stated in an earlier version of this tape, the antediluvian world isn't worth two cents. But the post-Diluvian world was worth a trillion dollars. The millennium and the millennial kingdom and the millennial age is superior to what we have now. And the resurrection state is superior to what we are now. And that principle of superiority and the recognition of it, which is really what the Genesis 10 testimony is devoted to, is the issue behind Laodicean lukewarmness 
in the seventh and last letter of Revelation 2-3. That the lukewarmness that the Laodiceans are indicted of is based on the principle that they're not recognizing their destiny. And the reason you know that is that Christ says to them, you know not that you're poor, blind, miserable, and naked. And those are characteristics simply of mortal mankind. And the Laodiceans, who through pre-mill insight ought to know better, are people who are backing mortality instead of looking to the immortal. And in order to encourage my fellow Christians to look to the immortal, not in skepticism, but in faith, an indirect method is to call attention to the early post diluvians whose high longevities and so forth, and privileges and all the rest of it, the peculiar glory of Noah's family, was a type of the glory of resurrection man returning in the kingdom. And this internationalism, where I skip from Iran to Syria of Ebola, you say, well, why Syria fit in that? was the original claim land of Japheth immediately after the flood. Immediately, when there was just, just a few years after the flood. He had a claim land in Syria, and the Egyptians, in fact, at one point invaded Assyria and fought the Battle of Carchemish. So it skipped from uh, one part of the Japhethite aristocratic heritage had to do with Iran, another part of the uh, Japhethite aristocratic heritage had to do with Syria, another part of the Japhethite aristocratic international imperial heritage had to do with the Pyra pyramid dynasty of Egypt, and another part of it had to do with Western Europe and the Celts. Tubal. At this point, Japheth's physical progeny yields to a powerful patriarch of the imperial line of Shem, Shelah's son Eber, father of both Peleg, uh, co-ruler of the forces of Arata, and Joktan, Sumerian, and Merkar, ruler of the opposing Eric at the time of the war. In other words, the, the, the war divided the world into two camps, and the head of the, of the Iranian camp was Peleg, son of Eber, and the ruler of Eric, which was the capital of the opposing Mesopotamian forces, was Joktan, the other son of Eber, and so Eber was the man on the spot. He cast his lot with the Arakite forces, becoming a Japhethite vassal, and therefore uh, following uh, the, what I call the Sheila Marduk uh, figure in his great victory over the Iranians, a victory that forced many of the exotic peoples of the world, the Austronesian linguistic stock, the Uralo Altaics, completely out of the Middle East in the time of the sub subsequent time of the Akkadian emperors when they were forced out. But the defeat in the Eric Arata War is one of the central events and the origin of the dispersion of the nations. As a vassal of Japheth and son of the Arakite general Sheila Lugobanda, Tubal Eber fought against his son Peleg, and in the Japhethite victory, he claimed the Iranian land of Persia proper, southeast of Elam. In the West Semitic community, he emerges as Ebrium of Ebleth. He is very important uh, among the Semites, and all the more so because he's genetically out of Shem, and Shem had already inherited the Semitic stock. So when you're seeing the Ebleite presence, of the Japhethites, Gumalam was a mere name, whereas Ebrium is a major ruler, and that again would show the difference. Yes, the, the, the dynasty of Ebria, of Ebrium, uh, the dynasty of Ebla, Ebla, is a Japhethite phenomenon politically, but it's rather abstract until you come to Ebrium because he was in fact an actual Semite, which is to say a descendant of Shem and participating in that Semitic linguistic stock that Shem had inherited from the curse on his brother Ham. The people of Lydia, I mentioned that Lydia, the, the Lydians are, are really the people of Peleg, uh, renamed in the Fokertafel, Lud being a, a version of Peleg, Eber's son, and the people of Lydia, the people of Croesus, you know, remembered him as Attis, whose mythological destruction by a boar alludes to the sack of Ebla by the Akkadian emperor Naram Sin, who appears in Genesis 11 under the name Nahor, the snorting one always associated with the bull image in the lunar cult, Naram Sin, the great warlord of the Akkadian Empire, Empire, grandfather of whom? Abraham. The dualism of Indo-European Persian and Semitic Hebrew reflects the general duad of the Gundestub Hirschnatter panel, Shem's control of both the Indo-Europeans of Yahweh that he originated and the Semites of Elohim in the fifth post diluvian epoch when he controlled both sects because Noah, through the curse blessing, had transferred the so-called Semitic stock over to him, so he controlled both. And therefore, Eber is a very characteristic Shemite in that he's associated both with the Sodom Indo-European Persians and with the Hebrews, that is, the West Semitic tribe of Eber. The Greeks remember Eber Tubal 
as Athamas, father of Phrixus, a version of Peleg, and a cognate where the L and the R are interchangeable, and Melikertes, which is a version of Joktan uh, as Baal Melkart, the god of Tyre. For the association between Tubal Eber and the Caucasian Iberia, now that's another, that's another loose end. Uh, up the, Ura the, the whole Tubal and Mishik business, the whole uh, Russian business, that's all part of this as well. It's another dimension. I haven't mentioned it yet, but it's there. Uh, but for this connection between uh, Tubal Eber and the Caucasian Iberia, Georgian SSR, see the next entry under Mishik. I don't really know if I answer that question about uh, the Caucasian Iberia because I have a very short section on Mishik. Meshech, the second generation Japhethite, was the son of Madai, as indicated by the East Indian genealogy of the fire god Agni and war god Skanda. So Agni is a version of the fire prince Madai, son of Japheth. And his son, Skanda, is a version of Meshech. The prophetic phrase, Tubal and Meshech, indicates the entire sweep of Russia from the Caucasus Mountains in the southeast to Scandinavia in the northwest. Uh, Tubal's genealogical name, Eber, accounts for Caucasian Iberia, of course, Iberia is also attached to the land of the Ebro, Spain, but there's another Iberia in the heart of the Caucasus, and it's, it's the modern Georgian SSR. Tubal's genealogical name, Eber, accounts for Caucasian Iberia, and Mishik's Indian name, Skanda, for the ethnic name Guti for Scandia, that is uh, Greco-Roman Sweden, that's the name for Sweden, and the Goths of Gotland Island. Vikings from Scandia, Sweden, created historic Russia among the otherwise distinct East Slavs. So there's a, there's a belt, a Tubal and Meshek. In, in effect, Tubal is the southeastern corner of the Russian territory, and Meshek represents the north, excuse me, uh, Tubal represents the southeastern corner, just as there's a southeastern position for Persia proper. But in the Russian world, the Caucasian SSR represents the southeastern corner of that world, and the northwestern corner is the Scandia, from which the Swedish uh, Vikings came, who are the original Rus. Uh, founders of the uh, of Kiev and, and Moscow. Tiris, the last Japhethite, the seventh, a son of Tubal Eber, distinct from Peleg and Joktan. Tiris appears in the. See, he's, a, he's a brother of Peleg and Joktan because he's a son of Eber, but he is distinct enough to have been carried over into the Japhethite clan together with his father Eber. Tiris appears in the Ebla dynasty as Shuradamu, son of Ebrium. All three of Eber's sons appear together in a tradition of Hellenized Asia Minor as Lydos, that is Peleg Lud, Kar, Joktan and Merkar, and Tersenus, Teros. And those are supposedly eponym ancestors of three racial groups. They're not just eponyms. The names are not imposed. See, the whole idea of eponym ancestry is another basic Baconian concept, namely that whenever you have symmetry and design, it's always imposed by the human mind contrary to fact. And that is as much a delusion as that very process can be. You can be deluded by symmetry, and you can be deluded by a willful denial of it through misguided policy. <laughs> Again, you know, eponym ancestry. The tradition that Attis had three sons, Lydus, Car, and Tersanus, happens to be true. He had three sons, Lydus, Lud, Peleg, Car, Joktan, and Merkar, and Tersanus, Tiris, cognate. The Tirsenoi of Asia Minor, in other words, the descendants, the race of Tirsenus, are believed to have been a branch of the same race as the Italic Rasena or Etruscans, who, like the Caucasian Japhetics of Ebel Tuber, spoke a language radically unrelated to Indo-European or Semitic. So these are linguistic odd men out, and that requires an explanation. I mean, how, why would these people speak a language unrelated to either Semitic or Indo-European or to any other language that we know about? A possible explanation for these exotic speakers is that they represent the descendants, now get the picture, the people of Caucasian, uh, of the Georgian SSR, speak a very radically distinct language called Jif uh, Caucasian Japhetic, and it's not related to anything, as far as I know. And the same thing's true of the ancient Etruscans. And the people of Caucasian, uh, the Caucasian, uh, the Ch Caucasian Japhetics are the people of Tubal, which is to say Eber. And the Etruscans are the people of Tiris, his son in the Japhethite context, and yet speaking language is completely unrelated to either the Semitic or the Indo-European. Why is that? What's a possible explanation? Well, a possible explanation for these exotic speakers is that they represent the descendants of Caucasoid captives taken by Tubal and Tiras in the Arakarata War. You, you know why I say Caucasoid captives? Because the predominant racial polarity of the forces of Arata that were defeated by the Japhethites was racially non-white. 
there were large numbers of yellow, black, red people, and just people not out of the line, uh, that original Caucasoid Canite line. There was much more white, much more of a white polarity to what turned out to be the victorious forces of the Arachite Alliance of Mesopotamia. But uh, there were exceptions to every rule, and therefore the people of Arata, the alliance of Arata, no doubt had some Caucasoid uh, folk in it, and there seemed to be some kind of a racial factor at work here in which all the whites were taken out. So there, there were none left. The people who were sent to Micronesia, or the people who were sent to the Far East, were uh, purified non-whites. 